Welcome to Season 1 of Press the Button. As part of this 10-episode season called Taking Back the Narrative, we are handing the microphone to members of communities affected by nuclear weapons so they can share their stories and their experiences in the ways they want them to be told. Today's guest is Mary Dixon. She is a radiation-exposed person harmed by nuclear testing and advocates for herself and others. A content warning for this episode. The conversation will discuss health complications. And now, here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Angela Kellett. Thanks, Jacqueline, and welcome back to Press the Button. Tom, it's great to see you today. Angela, great to see you as well. I'm looking forward to our show today as we pass the mic to communities that have been directly impacted by nuclear weapons to share their stories and to help them take back the narrative in our new season. Yes, and we are already three episodes in, and we cannot wait for the listeners to hear what we have lined up for the rest of the season. So, Tom, what nuclear news do you have to share with us? Thanks, Angela. Well, South Korean President Yoon suk Yeol was in Washington last week looking for reassurance that the United States would defend South Korea in any conflict with the North, possibly including the use of nuclear weapons. President Biden delivered promising Seoul more insight into U.S. nuclear plans in any conflict with North Korea and visits of U.S. nuclear armed submarines to South Korean ports. These announcements were meant to address the concerns of the South Korean public which has grown more supportive of Seoul building its own nuclear weapons in the face of mounting nuclear threats from the North. South Korea has renewed its commitment that it will not build its own nuclear weapons, and this is good news, but there are two problems with this overall approach. First, as we have seen, South Korea's need for nuclear reassurance is ever-expanding, and it may soon need more, particularly if the next U.S. president follows Donald Trump's past efforts to undermine the U.S.-South Korea alliance. Second, each effort to reassure the South also increases tensions with the North. North Korean state media reported on Sunday that Pyongyang would step up its military deterrence against the South in response to the summit, and no new ideas for diplomatic solutions have been announced. So the only way out of this spiral is to seek ways to reassure Seoul that are not based on nuclear weapons. Increasing the role of nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula is not in anyone's interest. And as difficult as it may seem, diplomacy is still the only way to solve this long-simmering crisis. In Ukraine, the Biden administration is wiring the country with sensors that can detect bursts of radiation from a nuclear weapon or a dirty bomb and potentially confirm the attacker's identity. This means that in the event of a Russian attack using a radioactive weapon on Ukrainian soil, the bomb's atomic signature could be traced back to Russia. There has been concern since Russia invaded Ukraine 14 months ago that President Putin would use a nuclear weapon in combat or could use a dirty bomb and try to place the blame on Ukraine. The Biden administration's actions, recently reported in the New York Times, indicate that Washington is taking concrete steps to prepare for the worst possible outcome of the Ukraine war. The Nuclear Emergency Support Team, known as NEST, which is part of the Energy Department, is working with Ukraine to deploy the radiation sensors, train personnel, monitor data, and ultimately be prepared to warn of any release of radiation. And finally, explosions near Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant are promoting a diplomatic push over how to avert disaster at the plant. Artillery fires and explosions occur almost every day near the power plant, which is near an active front line. The UN Atomic Energy Agency has been trying to get both Russia and Ukraine to agree not to position heavy military equipment at the plant or to fire artillery at it. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres' team has been telling diplomats and others that they believe that the International Atomic Energy Agency's initiative has failed, according to people familiar with the dispute. Senior UN officials have said since February that they plan to take over the diplomatic efforts. And in recent days, the UN chief has huddled with the two sides to discuss new ideas. The Atomic Agency has had a team stationed at Zaporizhia since the end of the summer, monitoring the status of the plant. 
And this week, I sit down with Mary Dixon. She is a radiation-exposed person harmed by nuclear testing. Mary shares her experience as a survivor of nuclear ops testing here in the United States, who is advocating for herself and others. She spoke of the emotional, physical, and mental strain of working to expand and extend the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, also known as RICA. It is a truly powerful conversation that I'm grateful that Mary was able to have with us. So please stay tuned. And please stay tuned for that story. And remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback helps us improve the show. Now let's get into today's episode. Hi, it's Angela Kellett, and today I'm joined by Mary Dixon. She's an advocate for radiation-exposed people harmed by nuclear weapons testing. Mary is one of many survivors of nuclear weapons testing here in the U.S. who's had to advocate for herself and others. It's something we don't talk about very often when we talk about RICA. In many cases, we ask, what is RICA? Instead of the emotional, physical, and mental toll of those advocating to expand and extend RICA. Between 1951 and 1992, The U.S. government detonated hundreds of nuclear bombs in the atmosphere and underground. Some were more powerful than the bombs used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It carried deadly levels of radiation, hundreds, even thousands of miles from the Nevada test sites. Communities affected by radioactive fallout have been physically, emotionally, and financially devastated. And the genetic damage is being passed on to future generations. The Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, RECA, of 1990 was a good start, but it's not enough. Without congressional action, RICA will expire in July of 2024. Activists like Mary are fighting to extend RICA and to expand who qualifies. Mary, thank you for joining me today, and thank you for all the work you've been doing on this issue. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, I think, very important, and I appreciate you doing it. Thank you, and I'm really excited for us to have this conversation. So. Currently, RICA compensates only downwinders who developed leukemia or one of the 17 other specific forms of cancer. Between 1951 and 1958, or the summer of 1962, in 22 largely rural communities of Utah, Arizona, and Nevada. Why is the criteria for RICA so limited? And who do you want to be included when we say expand RICA? All right, well, thank you for that. The radiation exposure Compensation Act has always been incredibly inadequate. It's very limited, and the reasons are strictly political. When it was first introduced, they wanted to include more, and they didn't think they could get it passed, which is why they went with largely rural counties in those three states. I'm a lifelong Salt Laker. Uh, My neighborhood where I grew up was devastated by cancers. My sister and I counted 54 people in a five-block area where we grew up who had various forms of cancer and autoimmune diseases, and northern Utah was never included. It's like they drew a line halfway through the state. If you lived on one side of the line, you were considered to be a downwinder and could be compensated. If you lived on the other side, you weren't. And so it's always been incredibly inadequate. And Our goal has been for 30 years to try and get that thing expanded so that it includes more of the people who were harmed. And the saddest thing to me is that many of them have died waiting for justice. And equally sad is that many people have no idea they were downwinders. They don't know. They think because that's where the government said you could be compensated, that it was limited to this little circle. Um, And they don't realize how far that radiation, um, the radioactive fallout went. It went all the way across the U.S. It got picked up by the jet stream and carried as far as upstate New York into Canada. Um, And the government knew that. They had maps of where the fallout from every test likely went. And when that fallout in the jet stream collided with snowstorms, rainstorms, that it literally fell out on communities below. So a lot more people were affected than they ever knew. Um, We know that Western states were especially hard hit. Uh, In fact, some of the hottest counties were in Idaho and Montana, um, not just Southern Utah. So we are trying to expand 
downwinder eligibility to include the entire states, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, and additionally Guam, because the testing in the Pacific affected the people of Guam. So adding all those areas, uh, RECA as it currently is, pays $50,000 to downwinders, $75,000 to on-site participants of the testing, and $100,000 to uranium miners. So what we're trying to do is get a, a flat $150,000 for each category. Um, because let's face it, like the $50,000 is nothing. It doesn't even cover your chemo treatments. Um, it, it's kind of a gesture. It's not really meant to adequately compensate and it doesn't. Uh, I know when, when RICO was passed back in 1990, H.W. Bush, who was then president, called them compassionate payments. Um, and it was always presumptive. In other words, if you lived in those counties during those years and got one of the forms of cancer that they said qualified, you could be compensated. You didn't have to prove it. And that's always been a really difficult thing because here you are, the people who were affected and got sick, and the burden of proof should not be left to you. Um, and so that's one thing that we're saying now is that it must remain presumptive. Even though there have been studies done since Arika originally passed, that show how hard hit some counties across the U.S. were. The, the big study was in 97, and that was the National Cancer Institute study of, well, what happened from exposure to radioactive iodine in the fallout. And it showed that every county in the continental U.S. got some level of radiation from fallout. That's big. That's huge. Um, and so knowing that, and looking at what counties got the most, we are trying to get it expanded because there were counties in Iowa and Missouri, um, even in Massachusetts, that were hard hit. And we knew that if we tried to add too much, we'd never get it through. And I actually see this as time is running out. You know, people will, will all be gone unless we get something happening now. And, and to me, it's a matter of social justice. It's doing the right thing. A government that harms its own citizens and knowingly harms them must be held accountable. And part of that accountability is, is the compensation. Because like you said in the intro, it's not just the physical burden of getting sick and trying to recover. It's the emotional burden. It's worrying with every lump, pain, and ache that you're getting sick again. It's what it does to your families. And, and for a lot of people, if they didn't have health insurance, it meant losing everything they had. I mean, there are people still trying to pay off their bills. So I, I think to do the right thing is absolutely critical. And a lot of times we'll hear the excuse, well, there's just not the money. And I have to say, in the, since 1990, the total amount spent on compensating people is about two and a half billion dollars. Okay, now think of this. Every year, the United States spends $50 billion just to maintain its nuclear stockpile. So what they're saying essentially is you're expendable, your lives aren't worth as much as our weapons. So I think part of the cost of having nuclear weapons, which that's another issue, I, I don't think anyone should have them, but part of that cost has to be the human cost. It has to be taking care of the people that you made sick. So you touched on this, that it's kind of this decision between who do you want to include and if it can get pushed through. Have you been seeing progress made 
even in small steps, of more equitable compensation and having this understanding that you can't just exclude certain groups because there's politicians who fear that it won't get pushed through. Yeah, that's hard because that's what happened originally and why it was so limited. So it's really hard for me knowing how far it went and how many communities and people were affected to then say, well, but we can't include you. It might not get passed. That's a really hard one ethically for me. And it would almost mean we'd have to have some sort of national health care if we were going to really take care of all these people. But one thing, this was interesting. Um, I have a friend who's a legislator here in Utah, and his family is from southern Utah where they are compensated. And he told me, he said, you know, if this were a civil case against a company that had poisoned its people, I could get you $5 million. And yet, because it's the government, all we get is what's been legislated, which is 50000 which really doesn't begin to cover the cost. But I always say, well, okay, what's the cost of a human life? What was my sister's life worth? What, what's my health worth? What are the lives of all the people I've lost worth? 50000 that's it, 150000 I mean, you can never adequately compensate someone who's lost a loved one or someone who's lost their health and their livelihood, you can never adequately compensate them. But I think we have to start somewhere. Um, and so we're pushing for this. We've made the most progress I've seen in the, all the years I've been fighting this because it's incredibly lonely work. And sometimes you uh, think, why am I even bothering? I've been working on this for 30 years and nothing's changed. And finally, it's, it's, there's movement. I'm seeing movement. It's like, you know, that old saying, ketchup, ketchup in a bottle, nothing comes. And then the lottle, because, you know, you'll hit and hit the, the ketchup bottle and finally it all comes out. Maybe we're, we're finally getting closer to that point. Um, and I would say a lot of that has to do with the national groups that have become our allies. And so we've got a frontline community of people who have been directly impacted and we meet regularly. And then there is the national group that's got frontline community members and people working for these various nonprofits. And they have been absolutely incredible allies helping us push this forward and helping us set up meetings with Congress folks. And we have, well, in the last legislative session, we had 77 co-sponsors in the U.S. House, and we had 24 co-sponsors in the U.S. Senate, and that's bipartisan. So that was major. And I mean, I went back to D.C. with some people to lobby last September, and it was amazing to me how few of our elected officials even know about this. They have no idea how far the fallout went. They have no idea how many people were made sick. Um, they, they haven't seen the faces. And we would have people constantly telling us when we went in their offices what a difference it made to hear our stories, the stories of what happened to real people who were patriotic Americans who were doing nothing but living downwind and, and in no way responsible for what happened to them. And the government, uh, like I said, they knowingly kept exploding those bombs. They knew where it went. Even before they moved testing from the South Pacific to the continental U.S., and they were having discussions of this. I've got the Atomic Energy Commission minutes, and they were saying, um, you know, we, it's got to be more convenient, it's got to be closer, and they had several different locations in the U.S., and one of them was in Nevada because the government already had that land, and they said that would be more convenient. And they had a meteorologist at the time who said, you can't do it there because in the U.S., the winds blow toward the east. It's going to carry it across the country. But they ignored it and they did it anyway. So to me, that makes them guilty of an incredible crime. And I would call it a crime against humanity. They poisoned their own people in the name of protecting them. I mean, when you think about it, the only country ever to drop nuclear bombs on us was our own government. We dropped 928 
928 bombs we exploded in the desert of Nevada. So we were bombed over and over again. You touched on this, that there is a difference when you go on the Hill and you have these meetings face to face and the yeah. elected officials can see the people, hear their stories. But you've been doing this for years. What is that been like for you having to do this work day in and day out? And like you said, sometimes see uh, no progress. Like, what is that told in? Emotional, physical, yeah. financial? Because you are reliving your drama to get mm -hmm. people to go on board for something that the government has documented. Yeah, I'll tell you, this fight, and I'm going to cry, um, it takes a huge toll. It's... You devote your life to something. And I did all this work while I worked full time for PBS Utah. And I would do this on the side. And it's so incredibly painful to dredge it up over and over and over again. You tell your story and sometimes you get through it without crying. And sometimes you barely start and you lose it. And I think they need to see those tears they need to see that this is something that didn't just happen in the past we live with it every day and dredging it up over and over is really really hard i know when we were lobbying i was always with a woman from cedar city utah who lost her daughter her sister and her father a lot of her family she'd lost and we had done like five meetings in a row one day and she just lost it at one of them and we had two more to go and she came out of there and she just said you've got to do the next one i can't do it i gotta go home i'm gonna go home now um because it is it's hard to relive that it's it's um I, I met a woman who was israeli and she does a lot of work with trauma and how it's passed on generationally and and i thought yeah you know what we're victims of trauma that was that was the trauma. It's kind of like having PTSD. And it's even harder because it's not acknowledged. People don't acknowledge it. And so many people don't know our history. They don't know what happened. And, and to me, that's one of the hardest things, like how many times I have to say, no, I'm not from Southern Utah. No, I grew up in Salt Lake City. And yes, I'm a downwinder. And there are people across this country who are downwinders and they don't they don't know it. And it's so hard for me to, to think, why is this not in history books? Why are we not taught this? And that's one of my big, well, I should say it's a goal. I don't know when I'll start on that one, I guess, after we get these bills passed. But it's to get it into the curriculum. And I actually met a professor in Chicago and spent time with her there. And and she teaches atomic history and the philosophy of atomic weapons. And she said she really wants to get it incorporated into the curriculum. I said, I will do whatever I can to help you. I'll, I'll do whatever I can because we can't forget it. It's like when something like this happens and so many people are affected, the entire community needs to come together to say this huge injustice happened and we have to line up with these people and help them. And we can't forget it. We, we have to keep it alive and remember it because that's how you deal with the sorrow and that's how you deal with the grief. And something that big that affected that many people must be acknowledged. And, and that's another one of the reasons I keep doing this. And no matter how hard it is, I keep telling the story. And whenever anybody asks me to speak about it, I will speak about it. Um, because I just think it's so important to keep that story alive and to increase awareness. Because if we don't, I mean, look where we are right now with nuclear weapons. If we don't say this is the human cost, there's a human cost, you've got to look at the people, we're going to keep like just going ahead with nuclear weapons as part of our defense. And we're going to test those weapons again, and we're going to have more downwinders. And I just think. You have to look at the human cost. And, and one thing I said, I spoke at Vienna for a big ICANN conference. And one of the things I told them was, if you look at it, the U.S. has killed more people with nuclear weapons than any other country. 
We bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We conducted 928 tests that blew down wind. And it's not just the people living under those clouds of fallout. It's the people who were involved in mining the uranium, the people who were involved in plutonium pit production. So every step of the way from production to testing to use, we've had victims. I mean, a lot of people have lost their lives in this whole dependence on nuclear weapons. Can I just say thank you so much for this and your resilience and your strength to keep doing this work because thanks. I feel like as someone who got a degree in this that you are right. It's not in the history books. It's not even in the advanced curriculums and it's just you cannot see what this is without the human cost and the people. And I think we say the word human cost, but it is people and the people and their names and their stories that are behind this that we don't talk about. And it's just, I I will keep saying this, but thank you for your work and thank you for doing this because the more that this is done, the more it needs to just get ingrained in people that we can't have a conversation about nuclear weapons without thinking about the individual people and their hundreds and thousands of them who have been impacted by this because they go oh, hand yeah. in hand. They, they do. You get it. You get it. And I mean, I guess I'm just going to go again with this is that you and your sister, you wrote this on the expandrica.org and you mentioned this in the interview. And if anyone needs to check out, please expandrica.org. It is great information on these people and their stories and their lives because it's so much more that we need to know about. You mentioned how you guys were the ones compiling lists of illnesses. Why is this responsibility keep falling on the survivors to compile the, quote, evidence and catalog these stories when they are just kind of reliving this trauma again and again? just to keep this evidence alive. That, that's such a good point. And, you know, as I sit in on my weekly meetings with frontline community members around the Western states and tribal members who have been impacted so heavily from uranium mining and people tell their stories every time and every one of those meetings um, involves tears of coming together and hearing each other's stories and how hard it is. And, you, you know, you look at the people living on tribal lands and like Navajo Reservation, some of them don't have access to running water, to electricity, and getting health care for them is incredibly hard. And yet they were put in those uranium mines, not given protective gear, exposed over and over, and they would track that home to their families. Their families would get sick. Um, and And so I just think, Wow, what we did to those people who cherish land above all else, and they were made sick by going into that land to mine this horrible substance. And, and part of the expansion of RICA includes adding uranium miners who worked beyond 1971, because they're not included right now. So, yeah, as you say, it is the stories, and I think the story is so powerful, and it's such a powerful way to get a message across, and and that's our best tool, I think, are our stories. I, I know my cousin said to me, your story didn't end tragically, so that you can carry the tragic story forward, and that's what I do. And we could not be more grateful for that, because I think stories like yours are so, I wish I could say they're uncommon, but there's so many different cases. And the fact that you're able to have yeah. the strength and to share this with us is just so powerful. Rika is due to expire in July of 2024. There has been made some bipartisan support in Congress, but to do right by those who are harmed and to give them a sense of justice that will never be fully given, but a sense of it, what needs to be done here and what are the steps that Congress needs to take? I think they need to hear from people. They, they need to know that people understand what happened. They need to be educated themselves 
And they need to sign on as co-sponsors to this bill and bring it for a vote because if it expires in 2024, that's it, it's over. It will be too hard to ever introduce it and get it through again. So I, I feel real urgency and I'm just hoping that we can get all the people who are still in office who were sponsors last time, co-sponsors last time, to be co-sponsors again. But I think it's just very important that they hear from people. I, I am just so convinced of that. I, I had one senator tell me once, he said, sometimes all it takes are 10 calls, 10 calls for me to pay attention to an issue. So they need to hear from people. And for listeners who may have not known this full story or know what the acronym is, but not the full story behind it, the people behind it, what should listeners know about RICA and where can they learn more to get educated and to help with the expansion and the extension of RICA? Um, a really great website is expandrica.org. Um, expandrica.org. It's very easy. Um, and I think, you know, just find out about it, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. That's its title. Um, and it's an incredibly important act, but it needs to be strengthened and expanded and extended. Mary, thank you so much for sharing your story today. And listeners, if you are just as moved as I am by this, Please check out the website and learn more about RICA and call your senators, call your congressmen, because if it's just 10 phone calls, we can do it. We can do it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Alex Hall, Angela Kellett, and Loan Billet, and in San Francisco by Charles Crosby. Audio engineering by Jacqueline Shing. Our theme song is Black Nymph by Peridot. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.